fellow Falcoholics. What is up? Welcome to another episode of the Dirty Birds of Brews podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Knight, here to bring you another Falcons mock draft. We are into April. We are in the final stretch of draft season, and we've got an exciting show for you today. A little bit of a different mock draft. I I went into this one saying, okay, we're not go the Falcons are not going to take an edge at eight. And we'll see how the board falls. You know, I was like, okay, if a wide receiver does fall, then maybe we'll go that route. And I would like to do a mock at some point with the wide receiver going at eight just to see how that, like, changes things. But um, as, you know, the title kind of spoils, what happens if Atlanta does draft a quarterback at eight? Um, I know a lot of people think they should trade down and all that stuff. And that's very much in play, too. But again, like I said on my previous show on Monday, how realistic is a trade down? A lot depends on who's there at the pick. If a wide receiver is there, then yes, the Falcons maybe could trade down and get one of these corners or whoever it is. But if not, they may have to take the guy they like best. And, you know, I know, uh, I believe it was Dane Brugler, the Beast was released today, his big board. Um, you know, when he has both Quinion Mitchell and Terry on Arnold above the edge rushers, he's not alone. There's a lot of people that feel that the corners are ahead of the edge rushers in this class. I'm not sure that I'm personally there, but uh, it is something to consider. And I, this is a staff in Atlanta that is very secondary heavy. Uh, we know Jimmy Lake has a lot of experience coaching defensive backs and has produced a lot of great ones uh, in his time at Washington. Kevin King didn't necessarily pan out in the NFL. He's back with Atlanta now, coincidentally, but excellent prospect. Ended up going like 33 overall, and that's far from the only one. So, the Falcons may, and they've got Jerry Gray as one of their senior defensive guys who also has a very secondary heavy influence. So the Falcons could realistically go that route, go more secondary heavy and try to scheme up the pressure, knowing that they have the coverage settled on the back end. That that could be a way to go. I know that's not necessarily the most popular way to do things, especially here in Atlanta where we haven't had a pass rush in what seems like forever, but it could be an option. So I wanted to, to dive into that today. This is not necessarily like a this is what I want. There will be like a final mock where this it'll be like, this is the guys that I want at these spots. And there is some of that in here, but kind of just an exercise this one. So don't take it super seriously. Don't, don't get too upset. Uh, and by all means, please do share your own mocks and, and sort of things you would do. If you, if, if edge rusher wasn't available at it, just pretend what, what, how would you make the mock? How would you sort of uh, do that? Share that in the, in the comments, if you would, uh, if you're on YouTube, and I'm interested to see how you guys would navigate it as well. Um, but we'll dive into that. Uh, before we do, real quick, I want to bring you guys a word from our sponsor, betonline.ag. Folks, the March Madness has ended. We're in April now, obviously. And BetOnline is now and always has been your number one source for all your summer sports this season from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoffs. They've got the stats, news scores, and all of that stuff available at your fingertips as you follow your favorite teams to the playoffs. I know the Braves have gotten off to a good start. The Hawks are, are on the cusp of potentially making the play-in. So there's some exciting stuff going on there. No football. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if they're they're probably doing this new UFL thing as well. So if you want to check that out, uh, the UFL lines and props and all that stuff. But no matter what you guys are interested in. You can get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there by going to betonline.ag. So what are you waiting for, folks? Head to that website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, folks. Quick programming update before we start. Uh, we will be doing another live mock draft for the patrons and channel members on Monday, I believe, at 6, um, 6, 6, 15, something like that, depending on when I can get home. Uh, that will There will be an announcement on the channel page and on the Patreon confirming the time and stuff like that. But just wanted to put that out there for everyone so you guys can get ready. That was a lot of fun. We did that a couple weeks ago. Wanted to make sure we got at least one more in for the patrons and members. We will also be having a live mock draft for everyone to take part in. Uh, probably the, the Falcoholic Live right before the draft that Wednesday. We did that last year. That was a lot of fun. Uh, still working on guests for, for those things. And of course, guests for the draft party itself, which will be... All three nights of the draft will be going as long as the Falcons have picks. We'll have plenty of liquor, in my case, or uh, orange drink, you know, exotic European drinks for Adnan and, and whoever else is here. I'm sure we'll have their own, uh, you know, accoutrements, however <laughs> you say it. But uh, that'll be a lot of fun. We'll probably go live starting at like 730. 
on Thursday and we'll be here through the whole thing. So you guys can join us for that as well. It'll be a lot of fun. Looking forward to spending the draft with you guys once again here. And of course, for NFL shop card giveaways as well, we've been giving away a $50 NFL shop card on on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then we will have a fourth card that we will give away to the patrons and channel members specifically. Um, so no, if you guys want to get involved with that, the channel memberships are here on YouTube. Uh, you can sign up on the YouTube page. Uh, and if you're more of a podcast listener, check out the Patreon. It's probably a little bit more your speed uh, for the same perks, same everything, just more podcast flavored. Uh, thank you guys so much for your support, all of you that are helping out there. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Um, all right, let's dive into this mock draft. And not going to do any trades in this one. We've done a couple with trades, uh, and I'm just going to stick to our guns here. I do think the Falcons are probably going to make a trade. I just... It might be more likely to be day two. I know everyone's very interested in trading down from eight. And we've talked about that over the years. And it's, it hasn't really happened that the Falcons have done anything in the first round. But they have moved around on day two. So that's probably more where I'd look. And again, I encourage you to go back and, and watch uh, Monday's episode or Tuesday's episode talking about the possibilities with trades if you're looking for more information there. But at round one, pick eight, we're going to go with my top corner, who is Quinion Mitchell from Toledo. Uh, at eight overall, and we will get into that pick here in just a second. All right, Quinn Mitchell from Toledo is a great player. Uh, I've I've always had a soft spot for Toledo. Uh, I lived in Toledo for several years, and <clears throat> that's you know my I have this affinity for Logan Woodside as well. Uh, but Quinn Mitchell is such an interesting player. It really dominated the level of competition in the MAC for two straight years with some just incredible advanced coverage metrics. And all the analytics kind of say that this is an elite cornerback prospect. And, you know, ends up coming to the Senior Bowl where this is like, okay, this is his chance. Like, he's going to have to go against all these top receiving prospects. The Senior Bowl had a lot of those good day two players there in attendance. And, Mitchell was dominant. Uh, he was the best defensive player in Mobile. And then he went to the Combine, put up a 979 RAS, including a 433 40-yard dash, which is absolutely elite speed. Hit a 38-inch vertical jump as well. Not the biggest cornerback prospect, right? He's 6 foot, 195, but that's that's plenty of size. He can play outside. Um, he really does check all the boxes to me of a, of a potential CB1 in the NFL. He's got the traits. He's got the coverage skills. He's scheme versatile. He's played really good man coverage. He's played arguably even better zone coverage, I would say. He's had ball hawking ability that didn't necessarily in 2023, didn't necessarily get the picks, tons of pass breakups, but um, only one pick in 2023, but he had five in 2022. So at Picks are very random, as you guys often know. So, like, he's he's definitely got the ball hawking traits. He's very effective at run support, very willing tackler, very smart and savvy with how he brings down uh, ball carriers. He checks that box. Again, scheme versatile. He's still got some things to clean up, right? I mean, I think, you know, with the routes, like, he, he could do a little bit better anticipating some route combos. He, sometimes, like a lot of these young ball hawking corners... Spends a little bit too long looking at the quarterback, not long enough looking at the, what the receiver's doing and can get a little bit tripped up. But he's got such good explosiveness, such good recovery speed. He he doesn't really have a lot of limitations and he can cover up a lot of those mistakes with just his the way that he plays the game and, and the traits that he has. So I think Mitchell is a NFL-ready starter from day one. I, I think playing him at cornerback two opposite Terrell would be absolutely perfect. He doesn't have to go up against these elite wide receivers from day one. He'll have some tough matchups, no doubt, but he will be probably able to take on the lesser of the two uh, receivers by playing opposite Terrell. Um, and that would give Atlanta a potentially great duo, uh, especially if Mitchell can hit the ground running. And we, and we know that, again, the Falcons may really want to make the secondary a strength and feel that they can sort of scheme up the pressure. You know, will they do that? It remains to be seen. But I think adding Mitchell, if they don't go edge at eight, I think adding the corner here makes a ton of sense because of the flexibility it gives them with AJ Terrell, who's probably going to be asking for that sort of luxurious need level contract. Um, the Falcons, if, if Mitchell hits the ground running super fast and looks great, maybe you do have flexibility with Terrell where maybe you're considering trading him next year. Um, maybe you do a tag and trade, maybe you trade Terrell mid season. Um, you know, you have a lot of options or maybe you just re-sign Terrell and commit to having a really, really good cornerback duo, uh, for the next, you know, four or five years while 
Mitchell's on that affordable rookie contract. So you have a lot of options there and potentially have really good pathway to excellent secondary play. Um, and I think you look at the rest of this cornerback room and you're, you're like, wow, this would be a great cornerback room. You got AJ Terrell, you got Quinn and Mitchell, and then you got, you know, a lot of really intriguing guys like Clark Phillips, I think has earned an opportunity to start, but you know, if he got beat out by at the eighth overall pick, that wouldn't be terrible. And I think Phillips being your CB three would be great. I think D Alford perennially underrated. I think he deserves to be the slot starter. Um, you know, Mike Hughes, I think he's actually a better outside corner. Makes sense. Um, but ultimately, you know, they also added some death guys, right? That they got Antonio Hamilton in here. Maybe they can do something with Kevin King as a reclamation project. This is pretty much you're you're good to go in the secondary for the foreseeable future. So hopefully, uh, you know, if they make this move, this will solidify that position for the time being. Of course, we're still looking for edge help, but we'll we'll get to that, right? We'll get to that later down the road. Uh, round two, pick forty three. I wanted to take an edge rusher here. Like I, I was kind of looking around to see if maybe chop would fall far enough to where it would be like easy to get up for him. He ended up going in like the mid twenties, which is absurd to me, but that's what happens uh, sometimes. So chop went super early. I, you guys know I'm not the biggest fan of chop. So I wasn't willing to trade into that range for him. I might consider like trading into the early second for chop. Um, I just, you know, I wouldn't really go up into the first for him. I don't, I think that's a little rich, but I know he's got a lot of fans and I respect that. Um, and obviously the upside is tremendous. So th they may consider trying to, to move up in the second round if they go this route to try to secure chop. Um, I just, I don't love Chris Braswell at this price point. I think he's more, I think he's like a fringe top 50 player. I don't really think he's early second round material. I do like Adisa Isaac, but again, I feel like that's a 50 ish pick like, or later, you know, and you might say 43 or 50, what's the big deal? I, I want to take a value here. I want to take a player that's great, um, that I feel really good about. And obviously if a wide receiver falls here, that's like really high up the board, like a lad McConkey. Um, I have seen Troy Franklin sometimes falling here in mocks. Um, and in this mock, in fact, he was here. I don't really think that's realistic. So I didn't take him, but if Troy Franklin was here or lad McConkey was here, then you sort of sprint up and make this pick. But I did still go with wide receiver because I feel like the value here is still good. You've got guys like Roman Wilson, who I've taken before. So I wanted to go a little bit different direction here and go with Ricky Pearsall from Florida, another big senior bowl winner. And again, we know how much the Falcons value the senior bowl and have valued it under Terry Fontenot. Pearsall, again, it's sort of a late day two prospect um, based on his, his college season, where I think people were very interested in him, but he wasn't really standing out in this clump of wide receivers we kind of have in this day two range. But goes to the senior bowl and just dominates. Like he's amazing. He shows off all of the skills, all of the things that there were questions at Florida because of the quarterback situation there. You know, he answered all those questions like against top competition. And then he went to the combine and tested out super well. I mean, a nine, nine, one RAS, uh, with a four, four, one 40, a six, six, four, three can, which is absurd. That's like 98th percentile. And then he had a 42 inch vertical as well. He is an ex explosive elite athlete. He is absolutely a potential impact starter. Um, and he, I think most people have him sort of pegged into the slot, which I think is fine. He's actually played both. Um, he played outside as well so he does have that versatility but I, I agree that he's probably a slot player um but he's super polished in terms of his route running he's got a great release package to get away from coverage he's got good hands not afraid of contact he's tough over the middle um i, I think pearsall could come in here and just immediately step into that slot starter role give the falcons another high-end option in the passing game that also kind of fills another role for them. Like they've got the size with Drake London. They've got the speed with Darnell Mooney as the flanker. And then Pierce Hawk can come in and be that sort of, he can do it all. Like he has the deep speed. He's not as fast as Mooney, but he's got the deep speed to do some stuff there. He can play after the catch. He can be that sort of chain mover if they need that. He gives them a lot of options and a really, really dangerous looking three wide receiver set. And I think pushing Rondale more down to that like wide receiver four is better for the Falcons and having him be a, a higher player on the depth chart, because I think Rondell Moore is very intriguing and having him as the screen guy, as the sort of gadget guy, as a, a depth player that can come in and play the slot if needed, if there's injuries, that's a better role for him than depending on him to be your slot starter. Um, so I'm very interested in seeing Ricky Pearsall in this offense. I think he'd be a perfect fit. And I think he's a tremendous value here as well. So that's where we go with pick 43. Um, 
And, you know, it's time to take an edge rusher here now at pick 74 in the third round. Um, I, I honestly just like the edge rushers here better than I do in the second round. Um, and I think, you know, here, going with another senior bowl guy, you're noticing a trend. I just, uh, Austin Booker from Kansas, uh, a guy that is such an, a unique prospect, very odd prospect, I guess we'll say. Um, he had a super quiet college career. Uh, prior to 2023, he was basically just a depth piece. And then he w- remained a rotational player only in 2023. But in his time as a rotational player, he got eight sacks and 12 tackles for loss as a, not a full-time starter, which is just bizarre to have that level of production and still not be a starter. Um, and then after that, he decided to just declare, uh, which I think was kind of puzzling, right? But that seems to have paid off for him. He goes to the Senior Bowl. He shines there, looks dominant. Um, and then, you know, after that, doesn't test exceptionally well, but tests well enough. He's still a well above average athlete, but he's got a good frame, you know, over six, four and a half, you know, almost 34 inch arms. But the weight is the thing with Booker. He's only 240, and there's reports that he maybe played in the 230s in college. That's a very odd, like, weight and profile. Um, and, you know, his ability to play the run is a concern. That is, there's no doubt there. But he's so technically polished in a weird way. He's got moves. He uses his hands well. But he's played so little. There's not very much film to evaluate. He doesn't play the run well, but he, he does have all this technical polish and obvious talent as a pass rusher. So it's like, it's just a bizarre evaluation. But goes to the senior bowl against top talent and looks great. Um you know, does a good job in various places uh, against various opponents in the Big 12. I He's an unusual prospect. There's no doubt about that. But I think he has, he is a designated pass rusher. I know some people have talked about him kind of like a Hassan Reddick as like a very light pass rusher who's really focused on pass rushing only. I think that kind, like I think getting him to the Hassan Reddick level would be quite a stretch, but like, that type of role where he's a designated pass rusher, but potentially a very good one. I think that's what he is. And right now the Falcons have run stoppers, you know, at at edge, like they've got Lorenzo Carter who can do that. They've got Zach Harrison. They've got these guys that can play the run. They really just need pass rushers. Um, So if Austin Bicker can come in and provide some pass rush juice for this team and develop maybe a little bit more into a well-rounded player, that would be nice. But even if he's just a high-end designated pass rusher, the Falcons could use that, certainly. Um, So I would be excited to see Booker here. I think he's got tremendous talent. He's just a weird evaluation, and that's kind of why he's going in this range despite flashing so much at the Senior Bowl. Um, An odd prospect, unique, but one that I really like, and I, I think he uh, he's worthy of taking a shot on here. And I think the upside at this pick is, is high despite – it being a third rounder. Um, next third rounder pick 79. This is the Calvin Ridley pick from the Jaguars. We're going to go back to the safety. Well, we're going to go back to my guy, Dadrian Taylor Demerson. I just, I've taken, we've taken a lot of safeties here, right. On all these mocks, you know, um, I know the Falcons visited with Kalen Bullock. I just, I can't do it. Um, I, he does not defend the run. He's a very bad tackler. And I think he's like a single high type of guy, but, he can't really be the last line of defense right now because he doesn't tackle. So I, I don't think that's the route they're going to go. They, the Falcons did visit with him, so they have some interest. And you can coach up tackling to some extent. But I think the Falcons want Jesse Bates to be their single high safety. So, you know, I think they're going to go for more of a versatile guy um, like that can play cover two and do a lot of stuff. Um, and I really like Dadrian Taylor Demerson. I think he is super underrated. Uh, I you know, he's very coverage focused. He's a ball hawk. He's make, he makes impacts everywhere. He's super good athlete. Um, you know, I, his coverage instincts, his versatility, it's all good. Um, he's played the slot before, you know, he, he's not huge, right? He's only 5'10", 197, but he has great tackling technique and he's very physical. So it's, it's like, he's significantly small. He, like he's Kalen Bullock 6'2", but Kalen Bullock's 10 pounds lighter. And Taylor Jamison's a drastically better run defender. So it's not all about the size, right? It's all, it's about a lot of stuff. He's not like a highlight real hitter. That's, that's what DeMarco Hellams and those sort of strong guys are for. Um, I think that, you know, Demerson will, be, will check the box as a run defender. He'll be fine there. Um, but I think he's a super 
good fit to play next to Jesse Bates and, and has the capacity to go play single high if the Falcons want to rotate their safeties or do some some you know weird stuff back there. Um, and I think if the Falcons want this elite run defending presence, they've got DeMarco Hellum. So like they can put that physical third safety in there if they want more box help. So I, I like this pick a lot. I think he's very underrated and I think he would be here in this range is, is a perfect fit for him. Um, going into the fourth round, pick 109. We're going to keep adding to edge because again, go waiting until the third round to address edge. It's not ideal. So you want to take a couple of shots here. Um, and this one is very much a developmental shot, but it's one that I like a lot. Um, and a player that I've really warmed up on over the process. And that's uh, Jalex Hunt from Houston Christian, um, who was a senior bowl guy. Didn't really make a lot of waves there. You could tell that going up in that huge jump of competition was tough for him. And that's not surprising at all. Um, if he if he had showed at the senior bowl, he'd probably be like a second round pick, you know, at this point. So Jalex Hunt, very interesting player, former defensive back from Cornell, transfers to Houston Christian, where they ask him to play defensive end, he bulks up. He's 6'4", so he's already big and has tremendous length. He's got over 34-inch arms, like almost 34-and-a-half-inch arms. He bulks up to 252 and and starts immediately uh, and, and has just stacked up sacks and tackles for loss for two seasons now. He And he's, a, he's an elite athlete. There's no question about that. Um, he just... It's it's such an interesting thing to see a guy with his size have also those like DB sort of instincts. He, like he moves very well, like extremely well. Uh, he's got that lateral mobility that few edge rushers have, and he's got that coverage uh, ability that few edge rushers have, which makes him kind of an interesting prospect. But in Houston Christian, he just wins because he's faster and he's bigger than everybody else. Um, he's got those unique movement skills, and it's just too much for his level of competition. He's not, he was fine against the run of Houston Christian. It's not like he lacks physicality, but I, he's not going to be able to do that at the NFL. Um, he's going to need to bulk up. He's going to need to work on his hand placement and all that stuff to be able to defend the run. I think he's got a really interesting developmental pathway. I, I think his profile makes him just a perfect 3-4 outside linebacker. We know that the Falcons have liked to do some weird coverage stuff with their guys. And, and you know, Lorenzo Carter is a great example of that. Um, he's going to need time to bulk up. Like, I think he needs to probably get to like 260. I think he certainly can. He's got a great frame. Um, but he's got technical work to do as a run defender before he can play base downs. As a pass rusher, he just doesn't have a lot of moves. He gets stuck on blocks, doesn't have the counters, doesn't have all that stuff. But he's got the natural talent, so he can get sacks just off of being athletic. It's just like that's not going to work constantly in the NFL. Um, but his package of traits, his movement skills his coverage ability, all that stuff, he can be a big-time special teamer immediately. So he's going to have a role. He's probably going to be active. He just needs to refine those other aspects of his game. But otherwise, I think he checks all those boxes. I think he has tremendous upside. He has legit starting upside. Um, and that's why I think taking him here in the fourth round is like realistically where you're probably going to have to do it because I know typically he goes like in the fifth and a lot of mocks and stuff like that. I don't know that he's going to last that long because this package of traits is really interesting I think he's a perfect developmental edge rusher for this team because he can stick on the roster as a special teams guy. Um, he he can do some interesting things. He can, uh, and, and I think if you needed to play him, he can give you pass rush juice. Like he can he can go out there and rush. It's not going to be hugely impactful, but he can definitely put pressure on and and threaten. It's just you know how many sacks is he going to get? I don't know. But this is like a more of a wait and see pick, other than the special team stuff. But I do really like Jalex Hunt. I think he does. He's that rare edge rusher in this part of the draft who could really develop into a starter. Um, and I, I like Jalex Hunt a lot. I think, you know, he's only played edge for a couple of years. The developmental timeline is there. I, I think uh, he's an interesting prospect. I, I'd be excited to add him here. Um, we're going to stick with the D line here on day three. Uh, round five, pick 143. We're going to go with a nose tackle uh, in Fabian Lovett Sr. from Florida State. We did get the unexpected news that Eddie Goldman has elected to come out of retirement again and rejoin the team again. Uh, but I, I I, think at this point, like, fool me once, fool me twice. Like, we're on to fool me three times with Eddie Goldman. And, like, as much as I like Goldman, I would like insurance, um, and I wouldn't mind adding depth at nose tackle because the Falcons have lost a lot of their nose tackle prospects at this point. So 
interestingly enough, when I was writing this up, I was I always look around and see you know where people are ranking guys and stuff like that. Lance, Lance Zeroline actually comps Fabian Lovett senior to Eddie Goldman, which I thought was really funny uh, when writing this up. But Fabian Lovett is a nose tackle. He is a down and dirty physical menace. Um, he's not flashy. He's not going to be a super sexy pick. He's not going to pile up stats or sacks or any of that stuff. What he's going to do, he's going to go in those trenches. He's going to smash interior linemen and he's not going to get moved off his spot. Um, he's big, man. He's 6'4", 315. Over 35 and a half inch arms. We know the Falcons are obsessed with length. This is the guy. If you want length on the interior, bam. He's a dominant run defender. He's going to eat up space. He's going to take on double teams. He's not going to get moved off the ball. Um, He's going to do the dirty work. He's going to do it well. And I mean, this is like a team captain type of guy. Like he was not, you know, getting a bunch of stats. He was not, you know, the flashiest player, but he, you know, just works hard, plays really well. This is the type of nose tackle that every NFL team needs. And getting him here, I think is, is good value because I think he can be a long-term starter for you at nose tackle. Um, Super powerful, hard to move off the ball. He just, he just opens up opportunities for everyone else. And that's what the Falcons need at nose tackle. They can't really afford to invest a lot there, right? I mean, maybe you could go for Devondre Sweat if he falls a little bit, but Lovett's like a cheaper version of Sweat. Doesn't have the pass rush upside, but very good run defender, very reliable, uh, long-term starter, fifth round. Makes too much sense, right? Um, I, I, I think Fabian Lovett would be a great fit in this range. And if Eddie Goldman does s- stick then you've still got a really good backup nose tackle. And in the 3-4, you know, you may need that. And I just, I think depending on Eddie Coleman to, to play a whole season is one is, is very risky, but having him even stick on the roster is another thing entirely. So we'll see what happens there. But I think the team would be very wise to get some insurance here with, with Fabian Lovett Sr. Uh, out of Florida State. Two more picks to go here, guys. Uh, sixth round. We're going to go with a guy that I, I really like and the Falcons did visit with, so I'm, I'm happy to finally get him into one of these mocks. And that's wide receiver Anthony Gold um, at pick 187 in the sixth round. I think he's probably going to go earlier than this, but there's so many receivers in this class, it could fall a bunch of different ways. So we'll talk about him here. Look, they did already add Ricky Pearsall. They, they don't necessarily need to add more receivers, but I love Anthony Gold. I think he offers a lot of upside. Um, obviously, he's small, right? 5'8 and a half, 174. That's why he's in this range, but he's an elite athlete. Uh, four three nine forty one five second ten yard split forty inch vertical at five eight and a half. That's crazy. Uh, and hit a four one six short shuttle, which is elite. Even at his like less than one th- one percentile size, he managed an eight eight seven RAS because he's such a great athlete. So that's impressive. Um, Gold was mostly like a deep threat for Oregon State. Uh, he did some other stuff, some yards after catch type stuff, but. He's actually pretty versatile. Uh, he actually started out as a slot receiver and then played more like Z flanker um, because Oregon State wanted him out there threatening those corners who didn't have good speed and they would try to align him against those guys. And that that ended up working out pretty well for him. Um, Gold was actually really impressive against man coverage despite his size, uh, which is a big feather in his cap. And success rate against man is one of the more highly correlated stats for NFL success. Um, and then also like, he's a very good returner. He was an all pack 12 returner in 2022. Um, and again, with, with there being more and more emphasis on these kick returns, having a stable of returners back there, the Falcons do have, you know, hopefully Avery Williams is back healthy. They added Ray McLeod, but like you need probably a number of guys in case there's injuries. Like we saw last year when the Falcons lost Avery Williams, that punt return game went to crap. Um, they need, you need more guys that can do this and they need to not be overly expensive either. I think gold is a great fit there. I think he's a good depth piece. He can sort of back up Darnell Mooney's role as the outside speedster. Um, I think he can play returner. He could play on special teams. And I think he'll be a good depth piece with the potential to grow uh, into a larger role. Obviously the size is not great, but as that sort of Z flanker speed slot type guy, I think he, he's very interesting. So I, I like that one here. And then round six picks, pick 197. I'm just trying to get more, guys in here you know i i always t- i like to take linebackers here just because it's it, this is a good place to take your pick of the developmental interesting linebackers um so we'll go with trevin wallace this time from kentucky you know the falcons do need depth at linebacker but they've got three guys that they're you're pretty happy with um and those are the three guys that are probably going to be active most game days you know maybe you'll activate a fourth one um depending uh, on what's going on but 
you know, it, I think Trevin Wallace is is interesting. He's very much a developmental linebacker. He was very inconsistent in college. Um, he needs to continue to hone his instincts. He's got to work on the play recognition and his coverage skills. You know, they're very hit or miss. So all of that to say, like, he's probably not starting anytime soon. But what he does bring is elite traits. Um, and that's what a lot of teams will be betting on at this point in the draft. So he's over 6'1", 237. That's good size for a linebacker in today's NFL. Ran a 4'5", 140, super fast. 10 foot seven in the broad jump and ended up with like a nine, three, three RAS. That's elite. Um, so he's got those traits. And I think, you know, right away on returns and stuff like that, he can be a special teams demon in, in coverage. He's physical. You know, he, he runs well, makes plays when he's there. He just doesn't see stuff happening in front of him very fast. And you're, you're going to have to teach him to do that. So, you know, how quickly can you get him up to speed? Because he's going to have to fight for that roster spot against all these other developmental guys. But I do think that the package of traits that he has make him really interesting, make him worth taking a shot on. Because if you can coach him up and get him ready to go, he he can make a he can make your roster and provide a lot on special teams while he gets up to speed. And again, because he has these level of traits, this is a, a potential starting linebacker late in the draft. He's got all the traits. You got to coach him up and get him ready to go. But if you do, you know, you could you could hit you could strike gold here uh, with a starting linebacker at almost pick two hundred. And I, I love taking shots like that at this point in the draft because. You know, you got to you got to take shots somewhere. Um, but yeah, that's our that's our draft, folks. You can see other than Ricky Pearsall and the other wide receivers, super defense heavy. And again, that's kind of what we're going to have to do because the Falcons invested all this on offense, getting quarterback and wide receiver and all this stuff ready. The offensive line, for the most part, is set. Running back set. Maybe we could see a tight end sneak into one of these picks. I'll probably do that in one of these mocks just because they've kind of been sniffing around some tight ends. So that I, that's a little bit interesting to me, but. Um, it's going to be a defense heavy draft, I think much like the Rams last year. And I think we'll see a couple of choice receivers probably inserted in there, maybe an offensive lineman, but, um, let me know what you think in the comments, uh, leave your own mock drafts, please. Uh, like, you know, let's, let's all, let's all take a shot at it. If, if just say, let's pretend edges off the board at eight. How do you do your mock with that? Um, so I'm interested to see what you guys have to say. Please do like subscribe if you haven't done so already. Uh, please leave that five-star review in your podcast platform of choice. Again, check out channel memberships, the Patreon. Uh, like I said, we will have the draft party coming up. We will have the next live mock draft with our patrons and members on Monday, uh, probably around 6 p.m. Eastern, but stay tuned for that announcement. And then, guys, uh, we will see you next time on the Falcoholic Live and the Dirty Words of Bruce podcast. I'm Kevin at Falcoholic Kevin. Check out the site for that sweet, sweet written content as well. We appreciate all of you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Have a great day, folks.